Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so called experts get it wrong. This week, a nuclear hot seat exclusive report. The hearing in United States Ninth District Court of Appeals in the case of the sailors of the USS Ronald Reagan versus Tokyo Electric Power Company. The case deals with the radiation exposure these sailors were assaulted by in the wake of their participation in Operation Tomodachi, the humanitarian aid mission following the March 11, 2011 earthquake and tsunami that caused the meltdowns of three nuclear reactors at Fukushima Daiichi. You will hear interviews with our attorneys, three of the affected sailors, and a former senator and U.S. vice presidential candidate in a case that holds the potential to put nuclear energy itself on trial. Plus, numbnuts of the week for outstanding nuclear boneheadedness, the nuclear reactor duck and cover report on what's gone wrong this week, and more honest nuclear information than all broadcast TV networks combined carried over Labor Day weekend. All of this coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, September 6, 2016, and here is the week's nuclear news from a different perspective. Starting off with the duck and cover report. Company Enersys warns of potential emergency battery failures at nuclear power stations as Hurricane Hermine threatens numerous nuclear power stations. Batteries are needed as emergency backup power for controlling the reactor and safely shutting it down. In the continuing saga of what's wrong with Watts Bar this week, the Nuclear Lemon in Tennessee reported a fire in the switchyard on August 30th that took more than an hour to put out. And the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station in Plymouth, Massachusetts, experienced an unplanned shutdown on September 6th, caused by a high water level resulting from a problem with a regulating valve. It's just the latest equipment issue with the troubled plant that is listed as one of the worst in the nation by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Entergy, its owner, announced last year that they would close Pilgrim by 2019. Just shoot it now and put it out of its misery. Better news as Omaha Public Power District announces an official closing date for the Fort Calhoun Nuclear Facility, October 24th of this year. Happy Dance by activists will immediately ensue, followed by thousands of years of dealing with the decommissioning and the radioactive waste that was created. Talon Energy Corporation has taken its final step to cancel a second nuclear power plant in Luzerne County, Pennsylvania, near Scranton. The Allentown Company said Wednesday it sent a written request to the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission saying it sees no viable path to obtaining and operating license for its proposed Bell Bend nuclear power plant. And near Alexander, North Dakota, an oil field waste landfill that withdrew its application to handle radioactive waste is under review for having tons of illegal radioactive material on its site. IHD Solid Managements was ordered to remove nearly 950 tons of the material and undergo third-party inspection of the landfill after radioactive waste was detected in separate inspections in May and June. However, IHD will not be fined for violating its permit conditions. Over to Japan, where Typhoon Lion Rock brought torrential rainfall to parts of Japan and followed on the heels of two other storms. It revealed evacuation failures throughout Japan, and now Typhoon Namtheon barrels towards the Sendai Nuclear Power Station. The Sendai nukes are in operation because Kyushu Electric Power Company has rejected a request from the governor of Japan's Kagoshima Prefecture that operation of Units 1 and 2 at Sendai be suspended immediately for safety checks. And at Fukushima Daiichi, TEPCO announced that the ice wall, known at Nuclear Hot Seat as the slushy, has been critically affected by rainfall from recent typhoons that have melted part of the ice structure, which was never solid in the first place. Highly contaminated water has thus leaked from the basement of the reactor buildings into the Pacific Ocean. More on TEPCO's radioactive water problems comes under a label, Fox reports that all is well in the henhouse. 
more than 600,000 tons of treated yet still tritium radioactive water is stored on site at Fukushima Daiichi. But a TEPCO hand-picked expert claims that it is safe to be released under controlled circumstances, whatever that means, into the nearby and convenient Pacific Ocean. Dale Klein, the advisor, who is a former chairman of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, said, It is much better to do a controlled release, in my view, than to have an accidental release. He went on to say, I get nervous about just storing all that water when you have about a thousand tanks. You have all that piping, all the valves, everything that can break. But whether the pot hits the floor or the floor hits the pot, either way, it's bad for the Pacific Ocean. And with news of the retirement of the governor of Niigita Prefecture, who opposed the restart of nuclear reactors, the chance of the Kashiwazaki Kariwo reactors restarting has increased, and as a result, TEPCO stock has risen the most it has in more than a year, 12%. We jump two ponds over to the U.K., where the nuclear powers at the Sellafield nuclear site in West Cumbria have their knickers in a twist over a whistleblowing documentary that aired on BBC last night, September 5th. Sellafield's nuclear safety failings is described as a special investigation into the shocking state of Britain's most hazardous nuclear site. With a high-level whistleblower, hundreds of leaked documents, and exclusive access to former senior managers, reporter Richard Bilton uncovers the truth about Sellafield. He finds an aging and rundown plant where nuclear waste is stored in dangerous conditions and insiders fear a serious accident. We'll provide a link to that program as soon as one is made available. And now... Nuclear Hot Seat Nuclear Hot Seat Nuclear Hot Seat None that's out of week Roads around Wick Airport in the United Kingdom will be regularly shut over the next 18 months so nuclear waste can be flown to the United States. No word if it will be going first class or coach. Politicians and activists have warned that flying the material is dangerous, but hey, what do they know? Local Member of Parliament Paul Monaghan described the deal to transport the waste by plane as morally reprehensible. So whoever thought this was a good idea, you are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of week. And now, our special report. This week, a Nuclear Hot Seat exclusive coverage of the September 1st hearing at the U.S. District Court in Pasadena, California, on the USS Reagan Sailors v. TEPCO lawsuit, the right of the sailors to sue Tokyo Electric Power Company for deliberately lying to the public and the U.S. Navy about radiation levels at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant at the exact time the Japanese government was asking for help for victims of the earthquake and tsunami that happened on March 11, 2011. The lawsuit is based upon the sailors' participation in Operation Tomodachi, Tomodachi meaning friends. This is where they provided humanitarian relief after the devastation caused by that earthquake and tsunami. The lawsuit includes claims for illnesses in the sailors, including leukemia, ulcers, gallbladder removals, brain cancer, brain tumors, testicular cancer, dysfunctional uterine bleeding, thyroid illnesses, stomach ailments, and a host of other complaints unusual in such young adults. Illnesses they were not suffering from before their participation in Operation Tomodachi, which exposed them to massive radiation exposure. These injured servicemen and women will require treatment for their deteriorating health, medical monitoring, payment of their medical bills, appropriate health monitoring for their children, and monitoring for possible radiation-induced genetic mutations. Seven plaintiffs in this case have already died since the legal fight began. Attorneys for the sailors say that additional plaintiffs are continually coming forward. 
There were 4,500 sailors on the USS Reagan who participated directly in the humanitarian aid issue, and up to 75,000 U.S. citizens in Japan who were potentially affected by the radiation and will be able to join the class action suit. At issue in the hearing on September 1st is where the lawsuit may proceed, a much more important point than may initially appear. TEPCO's attorneys have been arguing that any lawsuit must be pursued in Japan. But TEPCO is a multi-billion dollar for-profit corporation. These sailors are on their own. And given the expense of these already ill individuals to have to shoulder the expense of flying to Japan, bringing their doctors and other experts to Japan to give testimony, is cost prohibitive. And a decision to hold the lawsuit in Japan would essentially stop all possible recourse for the sailors. Presenting the TEPCO case were attorneys from Munger, Tolis, and Olson, a law firm that represented tobacco interests in at least one lawsuit in California against claims that cigarette smoking causes cancer. According to one attorney I spoke with, given the history of that firm, their selection by TEPCO was no mistake. Presenting the sailor's case are attorneys Charles Bonner, Cabral Bonner, and Paul Carlson Garner. Also in attendance to lend his support was former senator and vice presidential candidate John Edwards, who as an attorney is known for winning spectacular, precedent-setting decisions in liability cases. The scene in the courtroom was initially tense and subdued. Attorneys from both sides sat studying notes, acknowledging the opposition with brief handshakes akin to what boxers do in the ring before a prize fight when they touch gloves. When John Edwards came in, he was instantly recognized, and the effect on the room was electric. Charles Bonner graciously introduced him around, and as he shook hands with the opposition attorneys, one could see the effect he was having. There is something to be said about the visceral impact that comes with the glamour and celebrity of a former vice presidential candidate landing in your courtroom. Seats were taken, and the silence intensified as the judges entered. Presiding Judge Kim McLean Wardlaw, Wallace Tashima, and Jay Bybee. The TEPCO attorney presented first and had to field some pointed questions from all three judges. First to speak on behalf of the USS Reagan sailors was attorney Cabral Bonner, who spoke to several highly technical legal aspects of the case. I will spare you that information, as it makes for terrible radio, but we will include a link to the entire hearing on the website so that you can follow every bit of what happened. When Charles Bonner got up to speak, he started by introducing to the court three of the USS Reagan sailors who were in attendance. We'll be hearing from them later. Then Charles explained some of the reasons why the sailors require compensation from TEPCO. The interjecting voice you hear is from presiding judge Kim McLean Wardlaw. No, they have not been compensated, and the mere meager uh, benefits that they're receiving from the VA are totally inadequate for the kinds of problems that they are experiencing. They're being treated, but not necessarily compensated in terms of tort liability. That is correct. They're being treated, but treated in a very limited manner because many of the doctors can't figure out many of the complexities that these radiation uh, uh, diseases are presenting. So it's really beyond the uh, capacity of the VA. We'll have more information as to the problem with the sailors gaining appropriate medical care when we speak with some of them later in this special report. One major point at issue in this case is that by having a Japanese company called into U.S. court, it would somehow damage international relations between the two countries. Here the judge begins with a suggestion about one possible compensation method. We're speculating as to the U.S. policy interests. Maybe the U.S. interest would be to have the TEPCO give just compensation to the United States military who engage in humanitarian efforts on their behalf. That's a good suggestion. In fact, as Cabral indicated, we went to the State Department at uh, TEPCO's uh, request and we met with a large 
room of lawyers of almost the size of this lawyer from every department in the United States government, and they grilled us on all these issues, including whether or not the United States government should file a statement of interest. The fact that the United States government has declined to file a statement of interest in spite of their TEPCO's request and our detailed discussion with them is an indication that they do not feel that there's any tension between the United States government and the Japanese government. And Charles Bonner continued. In fact, just recently, within the last 40 days, I spoke with and sent an email to the U.S. Attorney's Solicitor General, Ms. Uh, Ginger Andes, requesting that they come in and come to this argument. So they are aware of all the briefs. They have briefed this case thoroughly. Their silence speaks volumes. Attorney Bonner then brought up the fact that the case has yet to be tried. All that had happened to date was procedural wrangling. These young sailors deserve their day in court. This is still just at the pleading stage, at the complaint stage. It, um, uh, it, we need to go to the discovery stage. If at that stage they unearth facts they believe uh, can, uh, would show a political question, uh, then they can bring a summary judgment motion, but not at this stage. These young sailors deserve their day in court under that flag and before this court. Another tactic of the TEPCO attorneys has been to raise the question as to whether the Navy acted reasonably under the circumstances. In other words, they are attempting to put the blame for the sailors' radiation exposure on the United States Navy. Here's what Charles Bonner told the judges. I'd like to direct the courts to one last point, and that is whether or not the military acted reasonably. In paragraph 141 of our complaint, it contains a publication from the Navy stating that the Navy moved the Seventh Fleet, temporarily repositioned it after detecting high radiation in the area, and that 17 crew members were irradiated. And they, we know that they positioned the ship out some 50 nautical miles where they were still taking on radiation. And then they went out 100 nautical miles where they, uh, Captain Mueller, Troy Mueller, documented the radiation as 30 times higher than normal, and that's in some kind of logarithmic progression. So the point is that the military always act reasonably, contrary to what TEPCO would have you believe, that some kind of way they were negligent or some kind of way the district court needs to evaluate the reasonableness of the military's action. The district court does not need to do that. The Harris versus uh, Kellogg case says the district court can Ask the question of who, what, when, why, not why, not why you get into the military reasoning or the military strategy or the military wisdom, but where the ship was positioned, how many uh, people were on the ships, where did it move in order to determine not the military's judgment, but the viability of these claims. And right now the only issues here are causation and damages. And then Judge Wardlaw made this stunning comment. The defense says it wants to bring in this issue of superseding um, causation, which, I mean, in a way, it seems kind of ironic to me because it was the Japanese government that asked President Obama to send the ships there in the first place, so then to turn that action into the superseding cause of the injuries does seem to turn it on its head. In other words, only after the government of Japan asked for our help did our sailors go to Japan. And now TEPCO is trying to blame us for injuries incurred by our sailors in Japan as a result. At least Judge Wardlaw seemed to get it. Charles Bonner responded immediately to her statement and included shocking information on the source of one of the TEPCO pieces of quote-unquote ammunition. You're spot on, Your Honor. It turns justice on its head because, of course, we are there to provide humanitarian aid. Indeed, Operation Tomodachi is help our friends. And now these young sailors, and that's why I call this the lonely sailors case, they, they feel abandoned by their friends. They feel abandoned by the amicus curiae brief here, which apparently was sponsored by the Koch brothers. They feel abandoned by their government. Are you talking about the Admiral's brief? The, the Admiral's brief. It's from a non-profit. It's not in favor of either party. No, it's, it's not in favor, but when you read through it, it's just a, a replication of the defense brief. It's the same issues. 
Um, but these young sailors, they feel abandoned by even uh, their government in not standing up behind them, and even their doctors who have difficulty diagnosing some of their illnesses, their leukemias, their excessive bleedings, and the cause of the death of now seven of them in a very short time. These were very healthy young 18, 19, 20 year olds who of course had to be healthy to get into the Navy, and now they're all sick. And we ask you to affirm the studious opinion of this uh, district court and allow these young sailors to move swiftly as they did when they were providing humanitarian aid to justice in this court. Attorney Charles Bonner, excerpts taken from his presentation at the hearing last Thursday, September 1st. Attorney Paul C. Carlson Garner addressed the court next, and I got to speak with Paul after the hearing at some length to get a deeper cut on the issues at stake and the strategies involved on both sides. Please note that all the specific information about the accident and the aftermath and the impact on the sailor's health has not been allowed to be heard in court as of yet. I have to admit that the rabbit hole of the law is sometimes hard to follow for those of us on the outside, and it did get technical. Could you boil down the points the other side is trying to make and why they don't hold water as far as you are concerned? The first argument being made is that we should defer to Japan, even though these sailors were in U.S. territory, they were on U.S. aircraft carriers, and most of them never set foot on the country of Japan. And because a framework has been set up in order to compensate people in Japan, the notion is that they could somehow avail themselves of that system. And that's really a stretch because they've had radiation exposure. They're suffering the consequences of radiation exposure. And to ask them to go back to Japan and give up their treatment regimen in the United States here, where they're getting care to the extent that it is being afforded to them, is, is really kind of adding insult to injury. It's a question of human dignity and the respect for human life. And these people should have the same rights, in our estimation, as any other U.S. citizen would have who was injured through the fault of another entity, a multi-billion dollar corporation for profit that was operating in a way that did not comport as reasonably would be anticipated under the law. Attorney Garner explained why some of the sailors are already showing severe symptoms of radiation exposure and others are not. He then shifts into speaking about the known history of problems of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear reactors. There is a period of time, a gestation period, that depends upon your immune system. Some people have an immune system that can deal with the toxins that they've been exposed to and that they've ingested better than others. So it's a matter of the host. And the effects may not show up for years because we know that. And that's very well known in the field. So hopefully you won't have to participate in a humanitarian mission where there's been a loca, <laughs> a loss of coolant yeah. accident, where somebody tries to blame the people who come there to lend a hand a humanitarian way. And they think that they can escape responsibility for their nonfeasance and their malfeasance before the fact, because everyone says this was a totally man-made and avoidable incident, which could have easily been prevented had they just exercised due care and caution in operating what everyone considers and knows to be a very dangerous way to produce electricity by boiling water in positioning a power plant in a precarious position and just ex ignoring all the warnings that were given to them over the years before that they could have a tsunami that would be higher than the seawall that they built and then positioning the backup generators next to the seawall so that when the tsunami came in it inundated them and they were without power. It happened on Friday at 2.46 p.m. was the earthquake. According to the then Prime Minister of Japan, 
Nieta Khan said that most people think that the core meltdown of reactor number one happened the next day on March 12th. No, it happened within four hours of the earthquake. So they measure it from the time of the earthquake, not the tsunami. And we know that there was nuclear release before the tsunami came in and wiped out the structures of the power plant, washed it all inshore, and you people showed up in the backwash the next day. There's plenty of time to warn. Plenty of time to let their government know about the true facts there. And they withheld the true facts, and then they covered up their knowledge afterward. And now they're trying to blame the people who suffered the consequences by saying, oh, your employer, the Navy, should have known better. Yeah. They shouldn't have come. They shouldn't have been where they were. Well, if they had fessed up to the reality of what happened there, the Navy would have been better equipped and uh, would have superior knowledge as to what they were getting into. You weren't going into a war zone. You weren't going to the power plant to deal with the radiation escape. You were going there in order to provide humanitarian aid consisting of water, food, blankets. This is the winter time in Japan. People are in the dark. And the people at the power plant who were running the power plant there had to do the best they could under the circumstances. They had to rush, take batteries out of their vehicles, cobble them together just so they would have lights to see what they were doing, to see the control room in a state of ruin, complete destruction. Then they thought that they maybe could control the situation. They reported to their uh, superiors in Japan at Tokyo Electric Power, a company that they thought that they were cooling down the cores of the reactor that everything was under control, but it wasn't. And when they found out that it wasn't, they called in the fire trucks, started pumping water in, but there was this mindset, we don't want to damage the reactors by putting salt water in there. Because once that happens, it corrodes everything. So it was placing their vested interests over the safety and security of those who were coming there to rescue, who never went to the Fukushima Daiichi power plant, who were miles away and could have easily been told, don't come in here, we have a nuclear blast zone. You don't want to come in here. You don't want to bring in a $4.6 billion aircraft carrier that cost the taxpayers of the U.S. to create the most powerful ship afloat to preserve peace. That's what it was being used for. It wasn't being used as a weapon for destruction. It was being used as a means to get a crew of 4,500 of you to go in there to do the best you could to help the people of Japan who were so impacted by this natural disaster. And they should have known. They could have known. And, in fact, they were pre-warned that this could happen. They knew that they were operating an accident waiting to happen. And it just strains one's common sense to think that they would be confronted by that situation. And then at the end of the day, when the consequences are being realized, that they would say, don't blame us, blame the rescuers. Because if they weren't there doing what they were doing, they wouldn't have been negatively impacted by it. It's kind of standing things on its head, don't you think? You get no argument from me, Paul. In speaking with one of the sailors who was there, Attorney Garner pointed out that even the government of Japan recognized TEPCO's failures in the wake of the accident. What we suggest is that everything that happened at Fukushima Daiichi was totally foreseeable. They were warned about it. The government of Japan did a post-mortem evaluation of the incident, and they said, completely man-made, completely avoidable. They didn't take proper steps just to put in place reasonable prudence. Just be reasonably prudent in your activities because you have something that if the radiation escapes from the core, you can't put it back in again. They could have asked for international assistance to deal with the situation, but they didn't. You guys are like downwinders. We then turned our attention to the consequences of these protracted delays in having the case heard. These people been afforded proper treatment early on. 
who knows, but they would have had a chance. Early detection, early cure has been the understanding throughout. And it's a situation where the system permits both sides to be heard, but the consequences of any delay fall upon the victim. And if you really want to preserve the status quo, you let the system go forward and take its course. We're at a very early stage of the litigation at this point. We filed a complaint, we filed an amended complaint, and we have asserted sufficient allegations, certain claims, that in considering where we are now, that would trigger the necessity to either admit or deny those allegations and go forward and get pertinent facts so that the trier of the facts can make an intelligent judgment as to what happened, who's responsible, and what the consequences are. And here we are. It's now September 1, 2016. This lawsuit was filed on December 21st of 2012. It seems extraordinary to me that the legal system would countenance further delay when it should properly recognize what the consequences of that delay could mean to the injured parties because dead men tell no stories. Nor do dead women or infants or the stillborn. We continued talking about the fact that the facts of this case have not even been heard yet. You made the point earlier that thus far all that's been argued has been procedure and law, but not the facts of the case. Nothing substantive has been determined. There is nothing upon which a judgment could be made by the trier of the facts because the facts haven't been elicited yet. All we have are procedural filings which should trigger either you admit the allegation that's made or you deny it. And so far there hasn't been a judicial admission of fault by the people who created this man-made totally avoidable disaster. It just speaks volumes as to the quality of representation that Tokyo Electric Power Company has received under our system of justice. And one has to wonder whether that delay would have been the same had the plaintiffs been in the shoes of Tokyo Electric Power Company and not had the resources that the power company has in order to essentially hire very competent counsel to go through it point by point and try to uh, assert things which essentially say, even assuming our client is responsible here, we shouldn't have to play the legal game in the U.S. It should properly be played over in Japan. So we're still at a point now where we don't have a determination as to where the game is going to be played. And we should certainly be beyond that point at this point in time. If you have any remaining doubts as to the importance of this legal case and who is paying attention to it, listen to the players Paul told us about who were in a very big meeting. It just seems very extraordinary that Charles Bonner, Cabral Bonner, and myself would have had to go to Washington, D.C., to meet with a group of lawyers, maybe 25 or 30 lawyers from every department within our U.S. government, to explain to them why it was that there is legal justification and precedent for going forward with their claims in our courts of law. And the fact that they haven't interceded, although the executive branch of government knows, we sent a copy of our communications as expressing our points of view to President Obama, to Vice President Biden, to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, to Ashton Carter of the Defense Department, to the Attorney General's office, for them to take a position now which seems to speak volumes and say, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead, as if anything will stop the forward action in this case. 
As for some of those moving ahead with the USS Reagan sailors, here is just a glimpse of who will be called upon to provide expert support. You mentioned Chris Busby. Is there any kind of work that is going on between the legal team for the Reagan sailors and Dr. Busby? I can tell you this, that we intend to rely upon the best and the brightest that the world has to offer us. And as far as I'm concerned, Dr. Chris Busby is one of the best and the brightest. And he has come to the aid of the British soldiers who have been negatively impacted there through exposure to depleted uranium and has tried to just get the facts out there. It's necessary that people recognize the consequences of their actions and what could happen as a result of that. So between him and certainly Helen Caldicott, who provided us with a declaration which we submitted to the Ninth Circuit Court in order to inform them of the consequences of delay in getting to this point, which has taken over a year to reach under our legal system, is so important. So we, we have to embrace these people. They have superior knowledge in this regard, and we can't afford to waste these resources that are there that could help to guide humanity in order to preserve life and ensure the well-being of not only the existing generations, but the generations to come. Attorney Paul Garner. In attendance at the hearing were three sailors from out of town who had been on the USS Reagan during Operation Tomodachi. First, we hear from William Zeller. Well, I'm William Zeller, and I sort of board the USS Ronald Reagan from 2011 till 2015. I was on board during the Operation Tomodachi, and I was a communication specialist for the ship. We definitely experienced a lot of different things and things that are traumatizing to us as individuals, and the things that we will actually come to see in the future as far as the assistance, the help, and anything that we will receive in, I don't want to say compensation, but in a way to help us proceed further with our lives, with the medical experiences we've had, that is what we really look forward to. What kind of difficulties have you experienced since Fukushima? I, I've had uh, bone deformations. I've had uh, muscle deterioration. I've had personal problems that I don't really care to go into about right now. But I also have had friends that have had problems with their pregnancies and having birth defects. I had a friend recently lose their six-month-old daughter. I've personally seen like the cancers, the tumors, and things that have come from it. Well, I can't say come from they have been proclaimed from coming from it. And I really just want to see the friends of mine get the medical help and treatment that they can, whereas not even the military can correctly diagnose what's the problem with them. They're having to get different diagnoses such as IBS, which is kind of a catch-all. So the situations that we see, we're not getting the professional care with the standards that we need to see the doctors, and unfortunately that does take money. We're only trained to certain expertise and level to assist us, and then we are outsourced to specialists and the specialists we need to pay out of our own pockets for those how do you think it went in there in the hearing as far as our side we we're very strong in the ground and foundations that we have set with the laws and judicial system i think that right now we're just trying to play the wait and delay game you wait too much longer and you're not going to have any sailors left to help out because they can't see the specialists so we're really trying to push forward so that we can actually get the health care. And I think that we have a very, very strong case. Everything I've read about, researched about, everything from the meltdowns to the current up-to-date to right after it happened, where there was no mention of meltdown for over three months, the E word was taboo to be used. With the situation that we're in, and with the court case that we just saw, I really hope a swift decision is made. 
to see it be drawn out again, such as uh, someone like uh, San Martino, when she did an excellent job, she researched, she took her time, and now to question, call into question her judgment as a judge, and already have proceeded over this, it really makes it difficult for us to go through another set of research this, research that, whenever someone of her expertise and skill level has already gone through it, and now someone's questioning even her. In a separate conversation, William Zeller gave this chilling description of what it was like when he first found out that there was a problem with radiation on board the USS Reagan. We were asked to come help out, go over there, set up a humanitarian relief situation, and what we ended up getting was uh, an announcement over the speakers saying, don't shower in the water, don't drink the water, don't eat the food that was washed in the water. And we ended up having to go to eat dry ramen, and we didn't have any water left because we'd already donated all of our water. So it, what our country did is we went in, we gave everything we had for what we had, and as soon as the situation hit, we had to pull back it farther and farther and farther until we could try and get into another safe zone and still give as much assistance as possible without being raided any more than we were. When it came to Japan's part of it, I would like to see the compensation as far as we extended a helping hand. I would like to see the return. You know, it's not like we expected it to begin with because we didn't expect the situation. USS Reagan naval veteran William Zeller. Next, I spoke with intelligence specialist Chris Chamel. What were you doing? How were you impacted when you first began the humanitarian aid with, mission? Uh, well, with the intel section, we were actually locating. Uh, people that needed assistance, whether it was clothing or food, and uh, we were plotting where they were located so our pilots could go and drop off uh, life-saving equipment. So I was in charge of tracking all that. Incredible job. How did you become aware of the radiation problem, and what were your thoughts when you did? I had just flown on. I just transferred to the Reagan on the 28th of February, so this was... As soon as I got there, the tsunami happened, and my heart dropped. I have four kids, so that's all I was thinking of is what are we going to be exposed to? Just because who knows what the government actually tells us is accurate or not. It's how, you know, I'm skeptical in that sense. I was worried. I was worried about my family, my wife. What, if any, health impact have you had in the five years since then? Um, I've had some growths um, that I've had taken care of. I do definitely have the irritable bowel. Um, and then I've had a couple other issues that I was actually in, uh, medically retired from the Navy almost two years ago because of issues that I've, I guess, I don't want to say acquired, but uh, what's the good word I'm looking for? Influenced by? <laughs> causal? <laughs> Something like that. That works. So with your retirement from the Navy, what is your status now in terms of health care? Are you taken care of by the VA? Do you have to go to specialists? Is this on your own dime? I use VA. I'm 100% covered, so I could use both VA and TRICARE. It's uh, work. It's a lot of work to try to get referrals and appointments. Um, I think I set up three appointments last week, and they're not till October. October, November time frame. And then once the appointments typically do come up, I usually get a call a day or two before saying that they were canceled, the doctor's going to be out of town. So it's it's always one thing after another. You go there and you actually don't see the specialist that you were hoping to see. I'm not satisfied with the health care, but that's, once again, I mean, VA, you get what you pay for. It's free. <laughs> Our tax dollars at work, actually. <laughs> I honestly don't really think about it that much. I joke about it sometimes, which isn't funny, but it's more of a sarcasm, a saying that they actually wouldn't take care of us. How do you think the hearing went, and how do you think the case is going? I think our defense did a great job. The judges had a lot of good questions for both sides, so I'm hopeful. And uh, we'll see in the next few months what the outcome is. Chris Schimmel. Chad Holt came the greatest distance to witness the hearing. I actually flew out from San Antonio, Texas. I'm interested in the case because I'd like to see how it goes, but how it goes, it's really up to the judges in there. Either way it goes, you know, I'd like to see help for all the sailors that are, that are suffering and having problems. What was your experience during the humanitarian mission when you were on board the ship? 
we tried to do everything we, we could as far as doing our regular jobs. And then going above and beyond, we had to do door watches, make sure people didn't go outside to radiated areas. We had to give out equipment for the people to actually use in those areas as well. How soon after you got there did you actually find out there was radiation and start with the protective measures? As soon as they came over the announcements announcing that uh, don't take showers, don't drink the water, that's when we found out. Both me and Zeller were actually in the showers at the time. And how long after you actually got there and began the humanitarian issue did you hear this announcement? I believe it was about a day, wasn't it? Second day. What has been the impact on your health and the time since then? Well, pain, um, abdominal, chest pains. Also, I have digestive issues. I don't want to go into too much details, but, yeah, that's what I've been having trouble with. My doctor diagnosed with IBS, and he told me flat out that IBS is a catch-all because they don't know what's wrong with me. USS Reagan sailor and Operation Tomodachi survivor Chad Holt. I stated at the beginning of this story that John Edwards, the former senator and vice presidential candidate, was in attendance at the hearing. He is a practicing attorney well known for his defense of people caught up in corporate liability cases and winning big time on their behalf. I caught up with John Edwards briefly after the hearing as he was dashing out to catch a plane in order to ask him the obvious questions. John, what brought you out for this case and what made you decide to support these sailors? Well, I was uh, contacted by Charles, uh, who talked to me about the, the issue that was involved with all these sailors and uh, the humanitarian efforts. It was so impressive to me. Uh, the, the, what the sailors did, they served their country, they went to try to help the Japanese people. They deserve admiration and I admire them. Yeah. And the fact that they've been in this battle, Paul, Charles, Cabral, for years is also incredibly impressive. These are good people and a, an important cause. And as for his intentions regarding the case and the legal team? I have been asked to join uh, the legal team, and I've said uh, uh, I, we've still got to finalize some things, but I said it's, it's the kind of thing that I would love to do. So that's, that's why I'm here. So the chances look very good that former Senator John Edwards will be joining the legal team defending the sailors of the USS Ronald Reagan who were present and hit by radiation from Fukushima as a result of their participation in Operation Tomodachi. The final word on this story goes to Charles Bonner. I caught up with him immediately after the hearing to ask him Charles, how do you think it went in there? I think we've won. We've won. We're going to continue winning. We're going back to court. We're going to get justice for these uh, sailors. I think you can tell by the questions from the judges, particularly the lady judge. She said, Japan called us in to help. It seems like to flip justice on his head to now claim that the, the, it was a superseding cause. Well, they're the one, they're the reason why we were there. They got President Obama to send the Navy there. And now they want to claim that they... Uh, don't want to compensate these sales. We've won this. Attorney Charles Bonner. A determination in this case is expected within 60 days. And, of course, we will let you know what happens here on Nuclear Hot Seat. We'll have a link up to a video of the full court hearing on our website, NuclearHotSeat.com, under this episode, number 272. That's where you will also find links to all the previous nuclear hot seats that featured the USS Reagan sailors and this lawsuit. I'll add my own comments regarding this case in just a few moments. But first, if you want to know what nuclear hot seat does, this is it. You just heard it. Where else are you going to get this kind of information in this depth on nuclear issues? Not just the facts of a legal case, but the human side of what's happening. That's what Nuclear Hot Seat brings you every week on every story we can find and cover. The impact of nuclear technology on people, the environment, and this planet. 
As attorney Paul Garner said at the start of our post-hearing interview. Thank you for coming here today to uh, follow the plight of these sailors who appeared to give humanitarian aid to the people of Japan and find themselves now in a situation where their health has been jeopardized, where uh, their lives are at risk. And we want to thank you for your continued interest in helping them. I don't consider covering this case or any of the others on this show as an option. It's a moral obligation and one that I do gladly. In order to continue to do this kind of coverage, however, your support is needed. So please, consider helping us out this week right now with a donation. It's especially important at this time because in just 10 days, I will be attending the Excellence in Journalism Conference meeting with up to 1,000 reporters, news directors, syndicators, and the like from mainstream media around the country and actually throughout North America. This nuclear hot seat on the USS Reagan case is going to be one of the programs I will be sending to every reporter and news director I meet. I want them to gain a sense of the magnitude of the stories they are missing out on the stories that await them with plenty of Pulitzer Prizes hidden within their neighborhood nuclear issues. You can help me do that. Your financial assistance will support my ability to get these stories and bring them to you, so help me keep doing it. For this conference, I am still a few hundred dollars short of my extremely modest budget, and I need to keep fundraising to cover the expenses. So if you have ever thought of donating to Nuclear Hot Seat, now would be an excellent time to do so. Any size donation will be greatly appreciated, from the equivalent of a cup of coffee to a winning lottery ticket. If you feel you got value out of today's nuclear hot seat exclusive on the USS Reagan case, help me secure the rest of the funds to do this trip to New Orleans upright so I can bring this story and so many others to the attention of mainstream media. Just go to NuclearHotSeat.com and click on the big red Donate button. You can donate by PayPal or use your credit or debit card directly. And if you prefer to send a check, you can get a snail mail address by sending an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com. Whatever you can do to help, thank you, thank you, thank you. Here's today's final thought. USS Reagan Sailors v. TEPCO. Talk about your David and Goliath battle. This is it. Everyone is weighing in against the sailors. A billion-dollar for-profit corporation. Even the Koch brothers, through one of their so-called neutral, put that in quotes, think tanks, putting forth an admiralty report that just copies point for point everything the TEPCO attorney's brief said, while making it sound like it's coming from an outside authority. Isn't that just like the Koch brothers? You know, this is a major international case. As you just heard, every branch of government knows about what's happening, up to and including President Obama, Vice President Biden, then-Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, Homeland Security, the Attorney General's Office, the Solicitor General's Office, and a Washington conference room filled to the brim with at least 25 to 30 lawyers, hearing why our three attorneys say it's appropriate and prudent for the court case to proceed in U.S. courts. And no one from the U.S. is telling them to stop. So it's okay to proceed. Only the obstructionist tactics of TEPCO and their attorneys are standing in their way slowing down the process, letting the ravages of radiation take out the sailors one by one. And those sailors are getting sick and sicker. Seven have already died. Most are being diagnosed by the Veterans Administration as having IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, which the VA admits is a catch-all for the actual diagnosis, which is, we don't have a clue. So perhaps IBS really stands for institutional BS. But the answer is right there in front of them. Radiation poisoning and the impact of radionuclides on human bodies. 
And the source? Fukushima Daiichi and the radiation plume that our sailors weren't warned about until it was too late. Imagine standing in a shower on ship and hearing over the loudspeaker, Don't shower! The water is contaminated with radiation. Oops! Doesn't cover it. We already know, it is public record, that TEPCO knew about the meltdowns at Fukushima long before they admitted to them. Less than two weeks ago, on August 25, 2016, a top official of TEPCO apologized on behalf of his company to the Neigita Prefecture Governor for having concealed the 2011 reactor meltdowns for more than two months. And as we learned earlier this year, TEPCO's then-president had instructed officials to not use the words core meltdown. But that's exactly what happened. Core meltdown. Radiation release. Catastrophic levels of radiation. And it got to our sailors. And it's not going away. Leukemia, ulcers, gallbladder removals, brain cancer, brain tumors, testicular cancer, stillbirth in addition to two live birth babies born with genetic defects, dysfunctional uterine bleeding, thyroid illnesses, stomach ailments. The list goes on and on. It's more than IBS. And time is not on the side of the sailors. Within 60 days, we will know if the appellate court judges will allow this case to move forward and give the sailors and the facts their day in court. Until that point and beyond, my gratitude, our gratitude, to attorneys Charles Bonner, Paul Carson Garner, and Cabral Barner, who have done Herculean work for over four years on this case. They are set to go the distance whatever it takes. And yes, this is truly a David and Goliath battle. I just wish to remind you all, David won. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, September 6, 2016. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from miningawareness.wordpress.com, timesfreepress.com, capecod.com, Omaha.com, Newsplex.com, McCall.com, BismarckTribune.com, Informable.com, FukuLeaks.org, Bloomberg.com, NWEMail.co.uk, EnergyVoice.com, Telegraph.co.uk, the journalism-perverting PR hacks slavering away in their cubicles at World Nuclear News, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the fantastic passionate, highly motivated, and extremely good-looking anti-nuclear activists from all over the world who gather at Nuclear Hot Seat on Facebook, where you are all invited to join us and like us, really like us, and share our posts with your friends and family. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompaniment by John Barnard, recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2016, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications, all rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, Reminding you that Nuclear Hot Seat is now downloaded every month in 112 countries. We are not alone. We are linking because we have all had our nuclear wake-up call. So don't go back to sleep because we are all in the Nuclear Hot Seat. Nuclear Hot Seat. What are those people thinking? Nuclear Hot Seat. What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear Hot Seat. The corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear Hot Seat. It's the bomb.